Great. All right. Hello, everybody. How many of you saw me in the morning? Yeah, I'm back here again. So somebody wasn't able to come, so the organizers asked me to fill in, and I have a talk now on on SEO. This is slightly related to the marketing talk that was cancelled. But it's quite a technical angle. All right, so my name is Otto. I work at a company called Seravo. We do upkeep for WordPress sites. That means that we don't, we're not a digital agency. Our focus is more on, on maintaining Linux servers and on the technical side of security, scalability, performance, and things like that. And I'm very enthusiastic about open source, and I like to go to conferences and spread information about best practices, how to use different software, and how to make websites. And today, I'm going to talk about search engine optimization. So why do I talk about that? Well, because the biggest, single biggest visitor to our customers' websites is Google's bots. And uh, there's like, if our company was a shopping mall, it would be the biggest shopping mall in Finland because we get so many people visiting and most of the people visiting to our customer sites come from search engines. That the, that's the single biggest source. It's, it's, there's more people coming in from search engines than from social media or for any, any individual. And I'm also old enough to remember Alta Vista. Who else remembers Alta Vista? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so things were not always like this. Yeah, and Google is obviously the biggest search engine most people are using, but there's also Bingbot, Yandex, and the Chinese have their own. But I guess most people use Google. All right, so I'm going to give some tips about how to make sure that you don't ruin your search engine visibility, because you can do some mistakes that will penalize you but there is no magic you can do to get the spot number one. If you want to be on Google's first page for a certain term right now, right here, then you just, the only way to do that is to buy ads, go there. And uh, there's lots of people who claim that they know what tricks you can do to play Google's algorithms. And Somebody might know something for a short while, but Google changes their systems all the time. So it's very difficult to play it. And if they realize, if you get caught for playing, trying to game, game their algorithms, then they will penalize you. And so whoever site you are optimizing will then be out of business. So therefore the ground rule for search engine optimization is to just make good websites. And if humans like it, then search engines are likely to like it as well. Because the job of a search engine, and for a search engine company, their product, the goal for their product is to show relevant results for their customers, and they want to give their own customers the experience that if you ask something for Google, and Google gives you this link, go here and read, then you will be happy that what you went and read was actually relevant and good content. So this is the ground rule. Just make good websites and good content, and Google will, the better their algorithm get, the higher they will rank you. And then to the details. So first of all, I would like to congratulate you for choosing WordPress. <laughs> because WordPress is actually out of the box pretty good in terms of search engine stuff and the standard teams are pretty good in how they work. And in general also if you think about an online strategy and you like want to have an e-commerce and you want to have a blog and you want to have some like special content and stuff then WordPress is a pretty good platform to build on because you can have in the one and same site, you can have integrated all kinds of content and e-commerce in the same place. So you will then build the reputation of one single website. And usually it's better to have one 
big website that's really good than to spread out and dilute your content and visibility. And here's a good talk. It's already pretty old, 10 years old, but it's still valid. It's from a Google employee explaining pretty much that since, since WordPress is so incredibly common, one third of the websites online, then Google obviously has done quite a lot of code to understand the content of general WordPress sites. And also WordPress is pretty good at all kinds of web standards and stuff by default. So out of the box, it works well and Google is capable of indexing and, and searching WordPress sites well. All right, so there's lots of things you can do to improve SEO and to more like grasp what the things are and categorize them. I've made these four steps of maturity regarding SEO. So the first level is getting acknowledged. And that's pretty easy. You can submit, if you have a completely new website, you can submit the address to Google and then it will start indexing it. And even if you don't submit, sooner or later Google's bots will find your website. So that's not a problem. The second level is to ensure that the search engine bots actually can crawl your site and, and find the information that's there. So to ensure that, you could have a look at your robots.txt file. How many of you have heard about the robots.txt file? Yeah, almost everybody. I will tell a bit about it. If you have a sitemap, then that will improve how search engines find your content and make sure it finds like all content. And then in general that your site works well, it doesn't have errors and the links work correctly. That will make sure that your site gets fully crawled. And then the next level is that your content, that the semantics of your content is correct. So when the semantics of your content is correct, then it's possible for the computers and the search bots to understand what is the content you have on your site and then kind of better match that it's relevant to what the users were searching. And there's a lot of couple of techniques listed relevant content, semantic structure, microformats, pretty URLs. How many of you attended the accessibility talk before this one? Yeah, so accessibility is really good because if, if a site is accessible, it's automatically also has the correct semantic structure. And it's not, it's just, it's not just disabled people who will be better at understanding what's the content, also search engines will be better at understanding what's the content. And then the third, fourth level of maturity is that Google not only knows every, all content of your site and knows, understands what it's about, but it also thinks that it is good and something that should be given out to users when they want this type of content. So there are things Google used to increase the ranking the first thing is obviously what Google was was what was Google's original idea to use this page rank algorithm but there are also other things they look at how how fast the site is and it's technically well designed it's responsive design and, and such and these are the parts I'm going to go through, and speci especially in the WordPress context, if you own a WordPress site, the, what are the things you should know about SEO? So let's start with what's built in to WordPress. So how many of you have seen this in your WordPress settings? Search engine visibility. So you should be aware that there's this tick box you can check in. So if you check this, then what it means is that the robots.txt file on your site will then disallow all search engines from indexing your site. So you can use that, for example, if you're building a new site and you don't want people 
visiting that site before it's published or or whatever reason you have and you should know that this setting exists so that you don't accidentally have it on in production on a real site which you want to have good search engine visibility and then another point this file uh, this slide illustrates is that in WordPress the robots.txt it's not a text file on your server. It's something that's generated on the fly, just like all the other pages on WordPress. So if you want to modify the robots.txt, then you shouldn't go and put a robots.txt on your web server. Instead, you should in your, for example, your Teams functions, PHP, you should add a function that hooks into the do robots.txt hook. So here you can see a code example of that. And if you go and, and put a text robots.txt file on your server, then WordPress won't be able to deliver the robots.txt that's built in into WordPress anymore. So don't do that. Let WordPress deliver the robots.txt file, and if you want to have modifications in it, then do that the WordPress way, adding a custom hook into it. All right. And then a second thing that's built in into WordPress. So most WordPress teams, so WordPress in general has this setting that it knows what is the language of a site. And most WordPress teams that are of any quality will print out this language setting in the HTML file. So there, in this screenshot, you can see that in this example, it's a site where the language is Swedish. This is a screenshot from the WordPress settings. And then when it's put to Swedish, the page will automatically tell search engines that the content is Swedish. So this helps search engines understand what is the language of your content. They can obviously also auto detect it, but this helps things. So if you have if you're doing a German site and you want specifically to be visible in google.de, then make sure that your site has, in the markup, it tells bots that the content is German, in German. And then one more thing that's in WordPress built in, well, kind of built in, is pretty URLs. And I hope nobody is using those question mark P equals something anymore. So maybe three, four years ago it was still pretty common. Nowadays everybody should have be, should have pretty URLs. It's a server configuration thing. If your server doesn't support pretty URLs, then you really need to change your server environment. And then also this is maybe the most overlooked thing so when you're uploading images to your blog posts or in general to the media media section of a WordPress site, it has these fields so that you can fill in the alternative text and caption and, st and stuff. So most people don't fill in this, but you should remember that WordPress has this feature that you can fill in them when you upload an image. And these features are important for accessibility, so people for example, who have vision problems and can't see the picture, can then read from this text what the picture is about. And also, search engines will read this text and use that as a hint what the picture is about. So if you're selling flowers, then hopefully you have pictures of flowers and the pictures have metadata that they are about flowers. All right, so that's built into WordPress. Then what about the WordPress teams? So if you look at teams on wordpress.org, for example, who those are all teams that have gone through some kind of basic team review, and they usually have all the basic stuff correct. For example, they are all designs nowadays are responsive. I remember a couple of years ago when not all websites were responsive yet, but nowadays everybody makes only responsive sites, so that's good. And also pay attention that the markup 
is semantic. So use the headings correctly and get learn learn the HTML5 standard. You should know what tags like article and section mean and use those correctly to mark up the content on your website. And there's also things like microformats and schema.org vocabulary. Does anybody know what mic microformats are? Yeah, a couple of people. So in, in the HTML standard, you have words like article and section. Those describe what the content is. But then you also have microformats that describe like more specifically that this section is, let's say, a recipe, or this section is an address, or this section is a, is a price of a product. So if you do your own themes, then learn HTML5 and also look into microformats. I have another slide about microformats soon. Um, how many of you use advanced uh, custom post types? Yeah, how many of you code custom post types? So here is a snippet that if you make your custom post types in code, then please pay attention to these settings because these define if that post type uh, is visible in the sitemap and if it, if it has archives and by extension if it's visible to search engines or not. So here is the semantic markup example explained. So it's a bit small, but I hope you can see it. So you, you have a div, which the class recipe actions, that's not semantic. But then when you look inside it, you have this div with item scope, and then it has an item type, and the item type defines that it's an aggregate rating according to the schema.org vocabulary. And then inside that item scope, you have properties, the rating value and the rating count. So this makes, so if you have the number five on your website, Google doesn't know what the five means, but when you have these microformats around it, then you can specify that this number five is specifically the rating of this recipe. So if you, if you Google for pesto in a, as an example, then you will get pesto recipes. And if you look at, look at this Google search results, they will show these stars. That's the rating. It will tell how many reviews it had, how long it takes to cook, and things like that. And Google knows these things based on microformats that are embedded in that recipe on that website. So if somebody specifically wants to find a pesto recipe that takes less than 15 minutes to make and has a rating of 4.5, then Google basically, if they have advanced stuff, they can use this extra metadata to refine the search. But otherwise, they would probably just show the high-rated recipes first. All right, so that was about WordPress core and the plugins, uh, sorry, the themes. And now let's move on to SEO plugins. Now, how many of you are using Yoast? Yeah, almost ev everybody. That's a very, very common plugin. But in my own opinion, I think it's a bit too bloated. It has too many features and uh, it has all kinds of uh, slightly annoying advertising and stuff built in. So my own favorite is this plugin called SEO Framework. And I like it because it's, the code is smaller, it's leaner. So that also has an effect on your website performance that your website loads much faster than if you have Yoast installed. And I like the way it makes a sitemap by default and how the sitemap looks like. And it has a couple of features built in, for example, canonical URL, which means that 
it will automatically redirect your visitors to the one and same URL and not show your content duplicate on different domains because search engines don't like to find the same content on different websites. Uh, the slug for this plugin is auto description, so therefore I have the plug uh, the link down there. But the name is SEO Framework, and if you have it installed, it's somewhat similar to Yoast that you will have this traffic lights green, yellow, and red showing that is the metadata and stuff correct in your blog posts. And they also have a migration plugin. This is slightly complex, so I have a slide for it. So if you're currently using Yoast and you want to try out SEO framework, then you need to have keep Yoast installed and install SEO framework, and then in addition install something called SEO data transporter. And with that plugin, you can automatically migrate your existing settings from Yoast to SEO framework. But the original name of Yoast was not Yoast, it was WordPress SEO. And the original name for SEO framework was Genesis. So therefore I have the screenshot that when you are migrating, what is the correct options to have here? <laughs> Slightly complex. All right, but once you're done with the migration, you can remove the migration plugin in Yoast. All right, and here is one thing that SEO framework generates for you. You can also do this manually, and there are other plugins that does it as well. So you can embed in your website this open graph and Twitter cards. And what they do, that they have like a title and description and an image defined. So if somebody takes that page and then pastes it into a tweet or a Facebook message, then with the content of this, you can define what the like the default social media card looks like. So it won't just randomly take a picture from a website, you can control what picture will be shared. And this is how the SEO framework sitemap looks like. If you go to the sitemap with the browser, it is an XML file, but it has a style sheet, so you can actually, as a human, also look what it looks like. And, and remember that the robots.txt, it, it's a dynamically generated content, not the file on your server. So when you have SEO framework installed, there will automatically be a link to your sitemap in your robots.txt after that. And then here you can see the settings of SEO framework and something worth mentioning is that you should not, it, it makes sense to have some of your pages marked as no index. So no index is a setting that tells the search engine robot that don't browse these sites and don't save them. And if you have duplicate content, then it makes sense to make some of that duplicate content no index so that your search engine won't think that you have the same content over and over again on your website. For example, if you have like normal categories based on like author and category, then there is no need for Google to index the same content again, browsing the date or attachment pages. Then there's also something called AMP, Accelerated Mobile Pages. How many, how many of you have heard about this? Yeah, I don't, I'm not particularly keen about this, but regarding SEO, I think it's something that needs to be mentioned. So Google is pushing for a new, new uh, subset of HTML and, and JavaScript and CSS. And the idea is that if you use a limited subset which has less functionalities, it's easier to cache the page. And what Google wants to do is cache, cache all the pages on their own servers, so that when people go to Google search results, then Google can immediately show the page to the visitor without having to wait for your server to generate the content. And uh, this 
kind of means that there will be a normal version of your content and then the AMP version of your content. And I don't think that's a good idea. It took, we had this like in the end of the 90s already that we had separate mobile pages. And we finally, after many years of work, all the pages nowadays are have responsive design. So I don't like the idea of going back to have two separate designs. There's also something called native AMP, but anyway. So here's an example of it in action. On the left side, you can see a page visited like on the, how it looks normally on, a, on the narrow screen. And then you can see that if you have AMP enabled, then the headers, there will be a AMP HTML link, which will tell that go to this address to see the AMP version. And then on the right, you can see the screenshot of how the AMP version looks like. This is technically how AMP works, but I'm not very keen about it. And then another plugin worth mentioning is redirection. It's a pretty nice and convenient plugin to help you redirect all the URLs to new URLs. And that's important to do because we hate link rot. Link rot means that you had one page at some address at some time, and then you renew the website or renew that page, and then move it to a new address. And you should make sure that the old address redirects to the new address so that when people from search engines or from other places end up to that link, they automatically get redirected to the new content and are not just met with a page not found error. Yeah, and then related to content and language and SEO, I would like to mention also that I recommend using Polylang. So lots of VPML seems to cause lots of problems and it makes the site slow. And if you're using Polylang, one of the good, good things in it, it, it will automatically make this reflang attributes to to your content and your links, which will tell search engines and screen readers and others that what is the language of the content. Yeah. You mean the slug? Yeah, so the question, if I understood it, is that can you have the URL translated as well? That's the, in WordPress terminal, it means the slug. So, uh, yes, you can have, yeah. All right. And then, as a last note, so Google ranks sites based mostly on how popular they are and how much links they get from other reputable sources. But there are also things that Google and Google engineers like. For example, they rank fast slides, sites uh, slightly higher than slow sites. And the reasoning is that if you want to give a good result to your end user, you prefer to send the end users to sites that load quickly because that's a better user experience. So that's, that's why Google is ranking fast sites higher, they are ranking responsively designed sites higher, they are ranking sites that have HTTPS protection higher, and they also like HTTP2 and IPv6 and other technical things and give them a little bit of boost. So to have all of those things in place, make sure that you have a good hosting and server environment that's actively maintained. So to summarize, in the WordPress context, these are the things you should technically make sure. And when you have technically everything made sure then you, that it works, then you can start focusing on making good content that's appealing to people and which will be shared and linked by people. And that's out of the scope for the talk today. But getting these technical things right is pretty easy and it's really sad to see if people have made great content 
but then they have made some mistake on the technical side and therefore they are not being indexed or, or ranked correctly. All right, that was it. Thank you. And then, then to the questions. There, you have been having your ha hand up for a while. <coughs> um, you talked about the multilingual plugins. Um, which alternative uh, have, or which plugin is good to input more languages in the website? Uh, sorry, I didn't understand your question. Uh, can you please go some um, sliders back? Yeah, it was uh, it's a little bit too uh, too, too fast. Uh, back to the multilingual plugin. Uh, 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 the language plugin. For more languages at the end. Yeah. Yeah, so you're interested about Polylang. Ach, Polylang, uh, instead of VPML. Ah, okay. But I didn't get the question. Yeah, so alternatives to WPML, so it's Polulang, and then there's also uh, something called Multilingual Press. And I think some people from inside are here at this conference as well, so they can probably tell more about that. So the, the reason why VPML is so popular is that it was kind of the for first multilingual plugin, and it got famous and big, and that's why it's well-known and popular, but it's not because of technical merits. We are creator of a software localization tool, and it's not good. <laughs> it's just... That's all. You were talking about uh, custom post types and um, their uh, display on uh, uh, the sitemap, uh, but WordPress is not uh, um, creating a sitemap uh, out of the box. Uh, uh, I think this should have to have to be um, uh, used by plugins. Uh, so, which plugin? Uh, you know, and it's another slide uh, where you have this snippet um, to create custom post types. And the text this says um, all listed in sitemap uh, XML, but WordPress is not creating a sitemap XML, but plugins do that. So which plugins uh, reflect that? Yeah, so in this slide I'm trying to say that Let's say on, on an average corporate website, you maybe have like a directory of your personnel and people usually implement that by making a custom post type person and then they put the picture, a name and phone number and stuff. And then they have one page called personnel or something contact or something and then they print all the stuff on that page. So that is the purpose of the personal directory. The purpose is not that every single person has their own page. And therefore, if you have like a custom post type like this, then you want to hide it from the sitemap. Even if you don't have any navigation leading to pages with individual people, you will have that in the URL structure, like because of the post custom post type. So you might want to hide that. Usually, people haven't haven't even designed any page that would show an individual person because the purpose of something like that was to make a like, page that lists the entire personnel. So if you go to that address, you will just have like a blank page or something like that. 
anyway, so it won't work. But search engines might list them or might try to go there and then realize that the site is broken. So it's better to hide away individual post types if if you have if they are not intended to be actual pages. The most of the time post type is not the same as one page of content. Yeah, and uh, about the plugins. So th this is how WordPress works internally. So this setting is not related to plugins as as such. Did that answer your question? Not really. <laughs> Something about the sitemap XML. I was wondering why you mentioned it. Uh, on <laughs> Sorry, uh, I was wondering why you mentioned uh, sitemap XML on this page. Uh, uh, I don't get the uh, the link between custom post types and sitemaps. Yeah, because everything you have, all the content you have in WordPress will automatically be listed in the sitemap. Yes, by yeah, the plugins that produce the By default, the sitemap. WordPress is not creating sitemap XML. By default, WordPress doesn't have any sitemap functionality. You need to install Yoast or SEO Framework or some other plugin so, so that I one will be generated. I was wondering if all these plugins who create sitemap XMLs uh, um, for real, if they uh, reflect if you um, set a page to no index or uh, a custom post type to, to be not public. Yeah, those at least SEO framework follows these settings. So they work correctly if you put the settings there. Okay. All right, here's a question in, in front. Um, I'm not sure whether I understood well. Um, you recommended to install the three plugins for SAO Yoast um, and CAO Framework and uh, CAO Data Transporter together to install all the three plugins together. This or is this slide is for migration. Yeah. So if you are already using Yoast and you're interested in migrating to SEO framework, yeah. then you need to have these three plugins installed at the same time for the duration of the migration. Mm -hmm. But once you've done the migration, then you can remove the excess. Oh, okay. And if you don't have any uh, SEO plugins at the moment, then you just go, uh, in my recommendation, just go and install SEO framework and nothing mm -hmm. else. I have Yoast. Yeah. But you so if you now have Yoast and you're interested in trying out SEO framework, then I recommend that you use this method okay. mm -hmm. to migrate so that all of your settings that you've done in Yoast and all the metadata you've put in posts and stuff will be migrated to the format that this plugin uses. And this slide and everything else, I will put, put up a link to the slides on my Twitter account. And this is my Twitter handle after this talk, so you can find the slide, slides from there. Does anybody in the audience have some extra SEO tips you want to share? Um, how many keywords can you transfer as an SE, SE, uh, Yoast SEO? You have can pay the uh, plus content to have more keywords. Is it in frameworks also possible that you have more keywords or? How many keywords you can have? So I'm not, I'm not sure if I understood the question. But there is this meta keyword tag in the HTML uh, code. But I don't think any, any search engine is using that because it's not, it's kind of stupid. They are using the description content, but the keyword tag is not used to describe the content. The actual content is used to describe the content. If that was your question, I didn't hear the beginning of it. 
Um, I have a question. Is it multi-site? Uh, can you use it with multi-site? Yeah. Your framework? Yes. And yeah. polylang too, I guess. If you're using WordPress multi-site, then everything, all of this works just correctly. Okay. Thank so you. no problems there. All right, thank you.